Ruth Ruff, David, uh, Davey, yep. uh, and just want to speak us about Ruth Ruff's dimension for your graph. Something that I think is very cool to deal about time. <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Davey Sivé, I work for Janssen, which is a pharmaceutical company that is basically part of Johnson & Johnson. And uh, we're basically looking at graphs for handling complex data, and one of the issues that came up was basically how to deal with time in graphs. So, first of all, let's just look how we generally do that. So, if you look at relational databases, and we have like a table with uh, a few rows and a few columns, what we generally do is to make sure that we know at which time something was created or at which time something was uh, updated. We basically have uh, generally at the end a few columns that say how we created it at that time or it was updated at that time. Of course, if something was updated, like in this case, well, well we basically don't know what was the previous value and uh, what was it. So <coughs> what we then generally do is we create like something like an all detailed table. Uh, so if something has changed, we say like, okay, this column has changed from this value to that value, and we did it on that date. Uh, um, in general, yeah, especially within pharmaceuticals, uh, we're very bound to all kinds of restrictions. So we need to make sure that at any point in time, we know how to get back to the original data. Um, but as you probably all know, if somebody would say like, show me the state of the database at like the 4th of March of 2012 and recreate me that state, if you need to do it based on this and this information, it's not very easy. Um, so in graphs, is the situation is maybe even a little bit more difficult. Uh, so. Um, yeah, our graphs are continually changing. And how can we know how the graph looked like, let's say, a few months ago? Um, now, if we look at the graphs at time, there's already people who have been doing some stuff around that. Uh, you have, for instance, David Montek of Neo4j, which has basically created something like Neo versioning, which allows you to have like a versioned version of your, of your nodes and your edges so that you can go back and say, like, give me the previous version. Um, we also have work from the Easy Foundation and also from Peter, which is basically more not really on how to go back, but how do you model time? How do you make sure that you can, for instance, if you have a few nodes that you can attribute them to, for instance, a month that you know at that moment in time it was created. Um, but there's, well, various problems associated with it in the sense that, um, let me go forward. Um, yeah, if you, if you look, for instance, at, at neo-versioning, it basically takes a copy of your node each time. Yeah? So each time something changes. So as a result, your graph changes quite, uh, the, the size of your graph at least, uh, becomes quite big. Um, we also have problems about object identity because you kind of create a new node. So the original ID of the node has changed. Well, it, you have a new ID of that <coughs> node. So it means that for some cases, if you would have cached something, it's not all that easy to find back. And also just, especially in the last two cases, you're kind of mixing your data model with your time model. Yeah? So it's really explicitly in there. And if you need to do a query, for instance, via Cypher, you basically need to yeah, take that into account and say like, only do me from this moment in time to this moment in time. So it's not that easy to deal with. Um, so what we wanted to do is basically check out whether we could create something that would have the ability to deal with time, but more in a transparent way, that you wouldn't need to deal with it yourself, but that you would just be able to do queries and in some other way deal with, with time at more at the API level. Um, so we want to go towards a time-aware graph. Of course, we don't want it to start from scratch, so we don't want it to invent a totally new graph database. Uh, so we basically implemented the Blueprints interface on top of Datomic. For people who don't know Datomic, it's a database created by Rich Hickey. Uh, it's quite cool. It's some of the stuff that I'm doing here is basically relying on the stuff that he has, but basically it's also facts. You add facts to a table and you never overwrite that kind of stuff. Um, now, what we want to do with FluxGraph is basically allowing three kinds of capabilities. At one hand time, travel through your graph through time. So for instance, you have one version of your graph and say like, show me the version like one year ago. Um, also have the ability, if you have a particular version of your node, to be able to easily travel back and say like, give me the previous version or that previous version, basically be able to iterate through time. And finally, um, also be able, if you have two versions of your graph at different time points, to do is an easy comparison, yeah, that you know like what has changed in this graph, how can I compare them? So how did we do this? Well, in fact, the API is very simple. Um, so imagine we create a new instance of our flux graph, and then we start adding stuff to that graph. Uh, so in this case, I create a new vertex. So this is all the Blueprints API. And I say, OK, set me the name of that uh, uh, vertex on Davy. I create some other nodes. I create a, a Peter node in the same way, and also create a Michael node in the same way. Um, what I then do is I say, like, OK, Davy knows Peter. I just create an edge between both. Um, now, 
what I then do is, and that's just somewhere in the code, I take a checkpoint. Yeah, I just want to know at this moment in time what's the date. It's not something, it's not that in Flux Graph you need to take like snapshots or something that you need to define in beforehand. This is a point where I want to return to. This is just to be able to know later on in the code, like, okay, at this moment in time, that was how the database looked. Um, and then we do some changes. So at the <laughs> end hand side, I will rename myself to David. And then I also add uh, an edge from David to Michael. Yeah. Now, if you would look on that on a timeline, you get something like this. So we first had uh, the original graph. Uh, then we had the checkpoint. Well, it's not really in, 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 in Flux graph, it's just in general. And then we have some changes and David became David and we added that edge. And that's basically the current situation in our graph. Uh, now, if you would use Neo4j or any type of graph database, you would basically be querying here. Uh, so this is basically our, our default point if you do any query, it's the current situation. Uh, but what if you wanted to go back to here? Uh, well, the API is very simple. Uh, you basically say something as, okay, we have the instance of a graph here, and we say set checkpoint time. Uh, and we basically give it the checkpoints, the date that we captured early on in our code. Uh, so what internally, what will happen within, uh, within Flux Graph is basically these parts of the graph will just be obfuscated. Yeah? So it's like that part never existed. Yeah? So if you would do a query at that moment in time, so you just set a checkpoint, you would only get stuff uh, that is stored at that moment before the checkpoint. So it wouldn't know that I'm now called David and it would also not know that I know Michael. Um, so this works very well. You can go back in time, go as far as you want. Unfortunately, you cannot go into the future. That would be kind of cool. Um, but the problem is if you are at a certain point in time, you want to be able to go back in time. Uh, and, and you want to find some version of, of a node where some property holds. Uh, but how would you do that? Because you have no reference point. You could go back in like one days or, or, or a month or, or a year. I don't know. So, so the problem is that even if whatever time period you take, at some point in time, you could get stuck. Yeah? So imagine we have this situation. So at T1, we have the node Davy. We make some change, we make another change, we make another change. And this is basically the current, uh, the, the current version of the node. Yeah? Um, so imagine that you would try to find the version of this Davy here. Yeah, how, would we, how would we go back? Do we go in hours, in, in minutes, in days? Uh, so basically, you would start here and then Silent, uh, slightly go back and hope that at some point in time you find that node. But it will basically depend a little bit how you did it, whether you will find that node. So we wanted to have something more well performant, but something that also uh, was a little bit easier to use. Um, so it's very simple, the concept. It's called time scope iteration. So you start at a particular node, and it's basically an iterator. You can say, like, get me the previous version. And it's like a direct pointer from this version of the node to the previous one. So you don't need to do fancy queries and that kind of stuff. It just gives you automatically back that previous version. So of course, we can go back, we can go back. But also, we can do the opposite. If we are at the original version of the node, we can also go in the opposite direction and, and go again to those nodes. Um, how does that look in the API? Well, it's very simple. Uh, so if we are uh, at some version of the node, we can just say, get me the previous version, which will give you back a vertex that is a previous version. Um, we can also, instead of getting one, just get an iterator where we can uh, just iterate through all the versions. Um, but sometimes you're not interested in all of them because if you have lots of changes and maybe like a thousand changes, yeah, you will need to iterate through one of them and, and that's kind of annoying. Um, so we also have a very simple API method where you basically provide like a filter. Yeah. Uh, that filter is just like an anonymous class or something like that where you specify which conditions should be true in order for that node to be returned. Um, what you can also do is if you have a particular node here like this one, uh, you can also ask like, through which time interval was that node valid or, or didn't they change it? So for, if you would ask it for um, the accent here, you would get T2 to T3, but T3 exclusive. Yeah. So you can basically know at which points in time uh, nodes were valid. Now, how do we define change? Um, well, for vertex, uh, whenever we set or remove a property, we consider that to be a change. Uh, if you add or remove, um, a vertex from an edge, we also consider that a change. And just when you remove the vertex in its <coughs> entirety. Um, for the edge, it's basically setting or removing a property or just the edge being removed on this, uh, on this entirely. Uh, now, in the beginning, we experimented a little bit. If you would change a property on the edge, yeah, for instance, uh, 
a relationship between two people, all of a sudden they got married. So you could say that that also has an impact on basically the vertices. Yeah. But it gets really confusing if you want to model it that way. And, and it's not easy to track that just locally if you have a particular entity like what has changed. So we didn't go that way. Um, now what is interesting to know is that if you go back in time and you're at a particular version of the node, that node is again time scoped. Yeah. So if you do, if you say like, give me all the edges that go out of this node, it will only return you the edges that effectively existed at that moment in time for that version of the node. Yeah. <coughs> so you can then again go into the future and, yeah. How do you model that it's being removed? Uh, it is modeled as being removed, yeah, as, as a fact in the atomic database that is sitting beneath it. Um, okay, now, uh, one thing that we wanted to do is imagine that you have this current version of the database and you have the database that we, that we had at that moment in the, at the checkpoint. We were wondering like, okay, how can we define what changed? Yeah? How can we know um, which kind of edges or what kind of properties were added or, or removed? Yeah? So what we've done and currently the definition is simple and it doesn't cover all cases, but it's, it's fine to start with. We calculate the difference between two versions of the graph as the union, so everything that is, 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 is shared by all of them, minus the things that are only in B. So if we, for instance, say, oh yeah, and, and we, we were wondering like, okay, how are we going to return this? Do we return like a list with the vertices and the edges and that kind of stuff? But then at a certain moment we thought like, yeah, but you can just return the change or the difference as a graph, which makes things very easy to work with. So to give you a concrete example, uh, if you have the difference of that, um, of that current version and the version that we took at the checkpoint, you basically get back this. Yeah? Um, so what you see here is it will say that my node has changed. Uh, so Davy is now called David. Uh, the node to Peter, of course, is not included because that didn't change, it's still the same. Um, we, however, have had an edge which was not there in the past, so we have this edge here. But nothing changed about Michael, uh, so this, the, 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 the node or the vertex basically has not any properties. Um, however, we still include it because otherwise you would have like an incomplete graph and, and you would have an edge, but in the blueprint stack it, would not, it didn't really match well to leave that out because then all, a lot of queries cannot be executed anymore. Now, this thing is just again a blueprint graph. So you can use Gremlin or whatever uh, <coughs> query capabilities uh, that are available uh, for going to that graph and getting to know um, what has changed between two graphs. Good. Um, so Flux Alpha in itself, we fully open sourced it, so it's available on GitHub. It runs on the, the Atomic basically has two versions. You have like an enterprise version and a free version. It runs on the free version, also on the enterprise version. You can use with any data store you want beneath it. Uh, it's open sourced, so uh, have fun with it and, and try it out for one. Um, now, a concrete use case. So why did we uh, at Janssen want to look at that? Uh, well, one of the things that we do is, longi is looking at longitudinal patient data. Um, so we have, for instance, uh, patient data about cancer patients. I want to know or to kind of do predictions like if you have this kind of behavior or this kind of diseases or you smoke or you don't smoke, what kind of effect does this have on, on long term? Uh, if you smoke a lot, will this mean that in general you will get cancer and that kind of stuff? Uh, so how do we model it? It's, it's in reality a little bit more complicated, but that's how we do it. So we have a patient at, uh, at the, the initial stage. Um, then at T2, something changed about that patient. Basically, he started smoking, so we have an edge from the patient to smoking. Um, at point T3, the patient basically stopped smoking. Uh, so instead of putting like a validity range on then the edge to indicate that that edge is no longer valid, in Flux Graph, it's really simple. You basically just remove the edge. Uh, and it's Flux Graph that will know at which point in time those edges were valid. So you don't need to care about that in total, which is very easy to work with. Um, at T4, uh, the patient unfortunately gets cancer and at T5 the patient dies, uh, which is not really good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, imagine the case itself. So we have historical data for around 15,000 patients and we have that over a period of around 10 years. Um, and one example analysis that we wanted to do is to check, imagine that you only look at the male patients who in 2005 were no longer smoking. Yeah? If we then would look at the situation in 2010, um, if they ever smoked before 2005 or did not smoke at all, does that have an impact? Yeah. So they were smoking in 2005, but no longer, well, afterwards, not any longer. But if they would have smoked before, does that have an impact? 
So how do we do a query? Um, so the first thing that we need to do is get all male non-smokers in 2005. Uh, so we, we have all data loaded in Fluxgraph. You just do it like uh, via the simple Blueprints API. So there's nothing different there. Um, and we basically set the checkpoint. We say like, okay, um, uh, the, the state of the database should basically be at the end of uh, 2005. And then we do a query, so we are interested in only getting the males, uh, so only getting the, the, the patients that have as a gender male. And then what we basically do is we want to try to find out whether they are basically having a smoking status, so whether they are smoking. And that's what we do, we, we use the relationship to find that out. Uh, so basically what we'll get to know is which patients were smoking in 2005 and which patients were not smoking in 2005. So we'll only continue with the patients who were no longer smoking in 2005. Um, the next thing we need to do is to find out um, whether these patients were smoking before 2005 because it's not because they were no longer smoking in 2005 that they weren't smoking before. Um, so what we do here is we use the, the, the method. So we, for each patient that we have, yeah, uh, we basically say, okay, get me the previous versions. Yeah, but only, and, and what we do is we, we provide a filter. Basically the filter is saying that um, I should only get back um, versions of the notes where the, po uh, where the patient matter was effectively smoking. Yeah. So if this iterator, if I do has next, then it says false, I know that there's no version or no version of my patient that effectively <coughs> smoked, which is very easy to find out. Um, and then the last thing that I need to do is to do the comparison. Uh, so I have my patient set in 2005, I have my patient set in 2010. Um, what I basically do is I calculate the difference. So in this case, it's for the, the set of smokers, so the people that were effectively smoking. Um, and we say like, okay, I have the version in 2010, I have the version in 2005, do a comparison, and what I will get out of it is the people who got cancer. So I can basically effectively uh, get to know um, which people have it. And, and if you're interested, if you really smoke, you have a bigger chance of getting cancer, but that's <laughs> kind of obvious, I think. Um, now, the problem with time travel, and at the moment when we started doing these things, it all looked very cool, and, 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 but at some point in time, you're doing queries and you have no clue what comes out of it because you have this, normally you're, you're working with your data, but now you have like this second dimension and that's not something you're usually dealing with. Uh, so sometimes when I looked at the result, I was like, huh? Where does this come from? I don't understand it at all. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to have a better way to look at the data. Yeah. So um, one thing that we looked at it was whether we would be able to visualize that. Yeah. So we looked at Giphy um, as a visualization because we also use it in, in, a, in a few other projects. And we basically wrote <coughs> uh, a plugin for Giphy for visualizing data out of Fluxgraph. Yeah. Um, so what you see here is basically your entire patient set. Uh, the blue ones are female and the red ones are male. I, I don't remember exactly. Um, but you see, in fact, here a few clusters. So these nodes, for instance, are uh, having cancer, ha smoking, and, and being dead. And you have a few people here who unfortunately have all of these properties, which is not really good. Um, but the cool thing now is that within Fluxgraph, you would be able to drag on like a, a timeline and go back to any point in time you're interested in. Uh, so if we, for instance, go back to the situation in 2001, and we didn't activate the force layout again, so it just remains as is, what you see is that the smoking node has a lot more uh, edges going out. Yeah? So there were a lot more patients smoking in 2001 compared to 2010. Now, even on this big graph, it gets difficult, but if you have like a little social network and you start adding nodes and removing nodes and you use the, the plugin, you really see how the network is growing and, and, and getting smaller. Especially if you then use um, Giphy to basically do some kind of visualization and analytics, it really gives you very nice results. Uh, now, at the moment when we started doing this, uh, we basically, s yeah, we were like, okay, we, we're basically implementing the Blueprints API uh, to visualize it to Giphy because at that moment in time there were no, um, uh, uh, there was no plugin available uh, for connecting to graph databases that support Blueprints. Uh, we have uh, a plugin for Neo4j, but not for Blueprints in general. Um, so part of the plugin, we basically open source it, so it's available on GitHub too. And as a result, you can also now access Neo4j and, well, well you, could, you could already do that, so that's, that's a new, but now you can also access OrientedB and Dix and Rexter and basically any uh, graph database that supports um, uh, the Blueprints API will be able to access it. Uh, I think that's about it. So. If you have questions, I think I'm a little bit fast. You have 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes, okay. Uh, okay. So we have 10 minutes for questions. Yes, at the beginning, when you spoke about the relational database and the issue you had, 
it's a result considering the relational database with the topal extension, um, like the topal extension of the SQL. Uh, what was the Okay, okay. Well, we didn't. Well, we, we were experimenting at. Okay, so so um, the question is uh, whether if you would have a SQL database with a temporal extension, whether you would be able to do similar things. Um, I, I never really uh, get uh, took that in consideration. Uh, we were experimenting at that time with graph databases. Our initial time was how can we how how would you treat something like that in a graph database? Yeah? Uh, and at that moment, I expect for the things that I've shown you there was little information available on how you would deal with that kind of data, or, or at least with time in graph databases. So the idea was like, how can we create something simple? That it, it's not that we would, I, I would not advise you to use this really in production. It was more like an experiment, a, a research to see how far you would get with such a database and what, what kind of capabilities you would get and more also on the site, like what kind of extensions or how would you need to extend the blueprints plugin in order to be able to deal with time in a very easy way without making it too complicated. Uh, doing predictions, you mean? What? Doing predictions or? Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So um, we didn't go that far because we had some problems on integrating it. But indeed, we I did some stuff <coughs> with Datomic where you can say like, okay, imagine that I would add these and these and these edges or vertices. Yeah, if you would be able to do it, then you would kind of be able to say if you would do like a, I don't know, shortest path calculations. If you would add these and these nodes, maybe you would get other results. Is, is that what you mean? Um, um. So you would be able to do analysis on, on a graph that is not yet transacted or not uh, yet persisted. Yeah. Uh, we tried to do it, but we had some complications on how to deal with it. Because currently, we also don't implement the Blueprints transactional API. Um, because the way how, how Datomic sees transactions is different than how other types of database see transactions. They see it as a logical uh, set of steps that you take. Yeah? And in, so in, in Datomic, it's perfectly OK to say, like, OK, add me something and then remove it. Re and adding and removing one thing within the same transaction is not the way how you should be s or how you are supposed to be using Datomic. Yeah? But with the, with the transactional API of, of, of Blueprints, and they have uh, <laughs> unit tests for that, it, it really tells you, like, OK, add a node, remove a node, and then trans uh, commit it and check whether it's not there. But that kind of building that kind of support into something like this through Datomic was not really easy. <laughs> so we, we needed to do so, so much administration ourselves that it kind of, uh, well, went too far to do it as a research type of thing. They, they have, in, yeah, in, in the beginning, and so the question is whether you can add stuff to Datomic in the past. Uh, in the beginning, it was indeed not possible. So at the moment when you started up your database, you would not be able to go back. Now they have an extension to go back. That's also the reason why I have the ability to import data from the past, from 2000, because otherwise you would never be able to get that data in. Um, however, the only catch is that you can only do that once. Yeah. So at the, at the moment when your database starts up for the very first time, you can also set a point in the past, so basically the transaction time, and you can go back as far as you want. But at the moment when you entered something in that database, you can never, like at a, at a later moment in time, still add something before it. So you can add sequentially until the current time point, basically. And then from then on, it's just adding stuff. So once you can do it, but if you, at a later moment, if they would come back to me and say like, hey, I also have this, this data set, which is also from the past, well, I would need to basically clear the entire database and start over. So you, you, never, you never consider event sourcing or stuff like that to, to support your, your time analysis? <coughs> Sorry, event sourcing? Uh, well, be because we really use the time model that is within the atomic, we, 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 well, we could have gone for a system where we basically manage all the time ourselves. That would have been a possibility. 
but then the implementation would have taken a considerably long time to, to be able to do that. Now, because of what was already available in the, in the atomic, it was quite easy to say it uh, like that, to, to be able to add vertices, basically just adding facts that describe what your edges and your vertices are and, and doing some administration to handle that correctly. Uh, further than that, we didn't really go. It was more like a, a research project, yeah. Uh, well, the atomic basically doesn't really store it. It's not that at the moment when you change something that it will take, in, in my case, like a full copy of the note like it was for uh, the Neo versioning um, um, API that, uh, that's, that is available for Neo4j. It's not that it takes a copy. It will basically just add facts. Yeah? So if at a certain moment in time uh, you just add one property, even though it could be like one year later, it will not take a copy of the previous thingy. Yeah? It just... That remains as is, and it's just that one fact that's got added. Yeah? So it's not ha having any overhead, it's just storing the facts that describe the graph as just facts. Um, you, you said you can't change things to the past after once you've imported it, but for example, your patient data after 2011, and you get into 2012, new ones in sequentially. Can you simulate this replay of this January, February, and February just in one import process? Uh, well, if you didn't cross, if you didn't put something in, uh, I cannot say it with... Uh, well, is it, can, can you separate between the time of uh, adding a new relation in the database with the time you're interested in in the flow uh, No, so, so it's basically, it, it, it's, it's the transaction time at which you put things in. You could, of course, put some properties at the level of the, the, the nodes or the edges, but then, of course, you're again managing that time yourself and that wouldn't really give you any, well, then you would be able to use the current systems like we have them available in Neo4j or any other graph database. What about the atomic license? Is there a difference between the atomic license? Yeah, well, the, so, so currently, I, we've just used the, 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 the community version that is freely available. Yeah. Uh, as the APIs are exactly the same, it's, I, I think it's no problem for them that, we, that you wrote an API on top of it that does stuff. I think uh, if, you, if you have the enterprise license, you can use whatever data source you, uh, you want to use. You can use a RIAC or DynamoDB or whatever, uh, even a SQL database if you want. So the storage yourself, it's free for you to choose. Uh, this runs just on top of it, but it's fully transparent to that, so it really doesn't matter what is running below it. Well-known class of um, template graph databases are source control systems. <coughs> we looked at the algorithms behind, for example, Git or Mercurial as the basics of your... Uh, no, not, not really, no. No more questions? Okay, so thank okay. you very much. Thank you.